Our next speaker is, is you know, very uh, experienced speaker, uh, have been traveling around the world and, you know, uh, I was really waiting what he will be able to present uh, at our meetups. Uh, unfortunately, he had a very important task uh, for his family, so they were waiting for a little baby. <laughs> so I'm glad that all things get sorted out and, you know, Ian is here with us today. Um, so I'm passing mic to Ian. Um, I'm very interested to know, are you uh, some relative to Sidney Crosby? Or? <laughs> Is my son playing hockey? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Maybe or maybe not. But I was pretty excited that you mentioned Halifax. Ça va? Merci beaucoup à Clara. Merci beaucoup à tout le monde d'être là. Je suis très content d'être ici pour pour la première journée. Je pense que c'est très cool. Euh, je continue quand même en anglais pour la présentation. Et, um, so I'm just going to start actually with a bit of a story. And this is a project that I worked on a while ago. And there's a company that was looking to move towards containers, container orchestration. They were looking at Kubernetes. And they had a few technical challenges. So they reached out to us for a little bit of help. And um, this company, student.com, runs an online platform for uh, students to book accommodations. And they do that across a number of different geographies. So most importantly for this story, a lot of their users are actually within China. Now, I'm not sure how many people have had to deal with uh, cloud infrastructure in China before, but things can get uh, a little bit complicated. <laughs> Hosting providers we're used to are not quite the same over there. Um, and any traffic going in and out of the country is not really reliable. So we have to deal with the great firewall of China, of course. Um, so there were some challenges. So what we needed to do for this setup was have a couple distinct environments. So the idea was that we could set up one environment uh, running inside China that would serve all the local traffic. Uh, and then another one outside that could serve international traffic. Now on top of this, uh, there was a pretty small DevOps team. So, you know, they wanted to be able to manage all these things from a single point. So like I said, there was a, a few interesting challenges. And I should mention this was uh, in early 2017. So at that point, Kubernetes was coming pretty mature at that point. Uh, and the ecosystem around it was still pretty active. So there was lots of new projects and new features. And there was one feature in particular which had recently been announced which seemed to us like a really good fit. And that was Kubernetes Federation. So, for anybody not familiar with Federation, this was a feature introduced uh, to allow us to manage multiple clusters. So we can spin up different clusters wherever we want, we can install this thing called the Federation Control Plane, and then we can connect all our clusters together, uh, we can deploy our applications across different ones. So, you know, this seemed like a really good fit for this project, it seemed to solve the, the need that we had. So we went ahead and, and started a proof of concept with, this, with the team. This is more or less what we built. So we spun up a Kubernetes cluster um, in Beijing, inside of China, to serve the local traffic. We spun up another Kubernetes cluster in Singapore, outside. And then we helped to install the Federation control plane, which uh, was on the Singapore cluster. And then we connected the clusters together. <coughs> now there was definitely a few hiccups along the way, specifically on the, on the China side with getting things set up. But eventually, deployed their applications, <laughs> and it worked, right? And this was pretty cool because we're using, you know, kind of cutting edge technology, this, this new stuff, to solve a real world uh, business problem for this company. So, you know, I was pretty happy about this. I should mention there were a few concerns with Federation at that point. It was a new feature. So, for one example, um, issues around security. The Federation control plane that we see here has root access to all your clusters. So, you know, if someone gets access to that, you're kind of in trouble. Also, it only gets deployed as a single instance. So you kind of have a single point of failure in there. But, you know, I, I spoke with the, the client and I said, you know, this is a new feature, but it's a very important feature. It's early days. You know, I assure you that once this thing hits GA, these will all be sorted out. There's, there's no problem. So if anybody's familiar with how Federation went, you might know how the story ends. <laughs> <laughs> There was, there was a bit of silence around this project for a long time. Uh, 
which was never a good sign. And then eventually we were greeted to this deprecation notice on the Kubernetes website. So essentially, you know, this nice, beautiful architecture that we had helped design uh, was essentially dead in the water because the cornerstone feature was essentially gone. So what do you think the moral to this story is? Other than don't ever listen to consultants. <laughs> you shouldn't say that. So for me, I think this is one of the risks that come in when, when you're an early adopter of technology, right? We all know that this space moves really quick. And products come in and, and features come in and sometimes they disappear. And you know, this is a risk that we take when we start with this early technology. So I'll come back to this story in a little while. Um, but today we're talking about the chasm. Is anybody familiar with the term crossing the chasm? Cool, several people. So I'll explain it uh, quickly. So it goes back to an older model, which, which is called the diffusion of innovation. And essentially what this does is it tries to explain when you have a new technology or a new innovation, this is how it gets adopted across the whole population. So we have it broken down between different segments. And as an example, the first iPhone comes out and you have the innovators. So these are the people standing in line for four days to get that first version. And eventually, you know, this moves on early adopters in the majority until the end, even your grandparents have iPhones. So this is a pretty old model. Uh, in the early 1990s, a man named Jeffrey Moore uh, did a bit of research and he came up with a book. And he identified a couple problems with this model. Basically what he said was, these different segments are unique. They have different demands, different requirements. So it's not necessarily the case that just because one group likes the technology, the next group is also gonna use it. And most importantly, he identified there was a really big gap that existed between the early market and the mainstream market. And this is what he called the chasm. So, you know, this is a, a place where a lot of technologies have just failed to make it over time, even after early successes. So some notable ones, Palm Pilot, Betamax Video, Virtual Boy. And I don't know how many of you actually came today on a Segway, anybody? <laughs> like 20 years ago, that was the prediction. Everybody was gonna be on Segways. So none of these, you know, there were, very good technologies at the time, but for some reason didn't make it into the mainstream. <coughs> so then this leads us to the obvious question, what about Kubernetes? You know, this is definitely an innovative technology, so where does it currently stand? And actually, I gave this talk first, or, or a version of this talk, a little over a year ago, and at that point, Kubernetes was in this chasm crossing phase, right? We weren't quite really sure if it was gonna, where it was gonna stand. So this is data from back then, and we already saw that it basically beat out the competitors. You know, so it had that, it had been grasped by the, the early adopters and the innovators. But the thing is that, you know, techno container technology and container orchestration was still relatively early on at that point. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of large enterprise companies using it. So then the obvious question was, will Kubernetes actually succeed in crossing the fence? So, slight <laughs> spoiler, if you fast forward to today, uh, I think it's become fairly obvious that Kubernetes has been pretty successful and has kind of made it into the mainstream market. Looking at some more recent data, you know, the adoption continues to grow. More and more companies, more and more large traditional companies are looking to adopt this kind of technology. Uh, this is even from the uh, Cloud Native Con in Seattle in December, so this is a keynote or even CNCF saying essentially Kubernetes has made it to this early majority stage. So, Kubernetes wins. It's now everywhere. Very exciting. Uh, but what does that actually mean? Right, what are the implications? It's just now everybody's gonna use Kubernetes. Well, I think, for me, this is what's really interesting. And what we're already seeing is that how this is actually changing. Is that mainstream market, if you look from the graph, is actually a lot bigger than the, than the early market. So this whole post-chasm thing is, has large implications. Because there's a lot of new different requirements, different challenges and different use cases that Kubernetes and the whole cloud native ecosystem are now trying to solve. And this is the one force that we're seeing. But on the other side, there's kind of in the other direction, these traditional large companies also have to modify the way that they're doing things or adopt, adapt themselves if they really want to leverage this new technology. You can't just take in all this new cool cloud native tech and still do work in the old ways and expect to get benefits. So this is really what I want to focus on today. Uh, 
so slight late introduction. Um, my name is Ian, I work for Container Solutions. And we're a cloud native consultancy. So basically what that means is that I work with different organizations who are going through these cloud native migrations. So they're looking to adopt this kind of technology. And in doing that, I get to kind of collect different stories that I think are interesting or common challenges that I see. Uh, and I wanna share a few of these with you today. So what I'm not talking about, just to, to be clear, is kind of the happy path, right? So all of these, I'll call them pre-chasm companies, you know, where you're 100% in the cloud, you already have a microservices architecture, everything's stateless, uh, you have no legacy to deal with. You know, there are a lot of cases that like these out there, but frankly, they're a little boring. Bring in Kubernetes, and yes, you're gonna see the benefits. So what I wanna focus on is more, you know, Kubernetes in the enterprise. Because these, these large companies, traditional companies, have different requirements and, and different challenges. And this is what I think is interesting, is how does Kubernetes, how does the ecosystem react to these? And then how do these companies themselves have to ac actually change? So we're gonna look at, at, at three different case studies here. And the first one is, uh, this is a large financial institution uh, in Germany that we're currently working with. And as you can, as you can imagine, you know, being a, a large financial institution, there's a lots of rules, then there's lots of regulations. And also being German, they really like to follow these rules. <laughs> so this, this doesn't necessarily bode well with, with cloud native, but they're in the midst of a quite ambitious project to really modernize the way they deliver and run software. And at the center of this, they're running everything or planning to run everything on Kubernetes, or actually OpenShift in this case. So one of the first questions which I think is interesting, which comes up essentially for any company who's looking to adopt Kubernetes, is how many clusters do I need? And for me, this is interesting because, you know, there's not a straightforward answer, but it's also changed uh, from what, are, you know, the pre-chasm days to now. In the early days, it was more or less straightforward. You know, Kubernetes was meant to share and optimize resources. So, you know, we only need one cluster. We'll scale it the, the size that we need. We can use the inherent features within Kubernetes to create isolation. So kind of a sample use case or, or standard use case is we have a Kubernetes cluster, we want two teams to be able to use it, so we give them each a namespace. And then they can go ahead and deploy their applications to their own namespace. And then if we're worried about you know, one accidentally talking to another, we use a network policy. And then we can block traffic as we need. But then one of the teams has a lot of traffic and they scale up, and so we don't want them to interfere with the other side, so we use resource limits. And this way, again, we get this safety that we're not gonna interfere with each other. We can go still further. We can use role-based access control or RBAC to ensure that you know, this team can't actually go and deploy or go and modify anything in the other team's cluster. And essentially, we take this model and we just scale it out as needed. You have more teams, scale up the cluster, and this is fine. And this works for a lot of use cases. And specifically, you know, I'll say in the early days, this was pretty standard. But what we saw at this, uh, this particular bank, and we see this a lot in traditional uh, larger companies, is that this is not necessarily enough. There are other reasons where maybe it does make sense to have more clusters. Now the answer is still not straightforward, but it's all about finding the right balance. And there are several factors that you want to look at when trying to answer this question. So on the one side, the arguments for having you know, fewer clusters is that obviously you have lower cost. You only have a single control plane or very few. Uh, your resources are, are better shared, better optimized. There's less operational load. You know, there's less clusters to manage, so, so less people needed. And of course, lower complexity. We only have one cluster, you know, aside from maybe some RBAC complexity, which gets in there. Generally, it's less complex. But there are a lot of valid reasons to go for, you know, more clusters. We get higher security. So, you know, as much as we can use all these different features to create isolation, it's obviously gonna be much more secure if we can run another server, another cluster on actual physical different hardware. And again, this is something that we see more and more as important uh, with these post-chasm uh, companies. If I want to run a cluster on, across multiple regions, well then I'm actually going to need two clusters, so I can't do this with a, team, a single one. There's lower risk. So if I have a single cluster and then I have a problem with it, I'm kind of screwed. But if I have 10 clusters running, then I have a problem with one, it's less of a, less of a big deal. And finally, scale. 
you know, a single cluster can scale up quite large, but eventually we do reach limits, uh, and it makes sense to have more. So essentially, again, there's no standard answer to how many clusters you should run, but you want to look at all these factors, decide which ones are more important. And what we see more, again, in these kind of mainstream market is that it's more on the right that are more important. So we can end up striking a bit of a balance. So I'll just show what we ended up with this particular company, what they have. As, so again, I should mention they're running on-premise, and they run across three data centers. So the idea is that what we created was we could have one data center related entirely to uh, non-production. So we get this safety in terms of isolation so that even if something goes wrong or something goes crazy in Dever tests, we're not going to affect production. You know, we still want that, that layer of security in place. And then for the rest, we have four different production clusters running. And an interesting case here is that there are some applications, for example, they have uh, which are public facing, and some are used only internally. So we could create this kind of separation where one data center is entirely devoted to public facing things. And then this other data center, we can essentially limit to internal traffic to again get that added layer of security that nothing is going to infiltrate from outside. And I should mention this, you know, this is a company with hundreds of developers and dozens of teams. So we still have the isolation within. You know, each team will still get its own namespace within the dev cluster to do their things. And we use these um, network policies and resource limits. So it's a balance of using both of these. Now, once you have all of these, your clusters set up and you're running, the next problem that we have is how do we manage these? How do we, how do we maintain restrict access? And again, you know, being in a financial institution, there, there are strong requirements that they have which don't necessarily go well with this cloud-native, agile, um, kind of DevOps way of working. You know, traditionally what they would do is if you want to make a change to anything in your infrastructure, you file a ticket, and it goes through some long, elaborate approval process, and then from there you gets assigned to some other team in some other building, and maybe a few weeks later you've got your change. You know, there's no way that this is going to work in a cloud-native you can install all the technology you want, but if you stick with these old processes, nothing's going to happen. But the problem is they do have some very strong requirements that they have to stick to. You know, they can't just allow everybody to get access to all the clusters. We need really strong access control. And we do need an approval process. You know, there are certain people that have to approve changes going into production. And finally, auditing. Right? Of course, we need to know every change that gets made uh, to every part of your infrastructure uh, across all your clusters. So how can we come up with a solution that kind of combines this, the flexibility and agility that we need with, with this strong security? How many people are familiar with the term GitOps? Cool, that's pretty good. Um, so this is kind of a, a brief definition, um, which I pulled off. So it comes from the, the people at WeaveWorks. And essentially it's a way to do continuous delivery. But the key is that we're using Git as a source of truth for everything. Not just our code, not just configuration, but infrastructure, everything. Git is your source of truth. And from that way, it acts as a mediator. And that any changes that we want to do, go through Git. So I really see this as an extension of the whole idea of infrastructure as code. You know, we're taking not just the tools, not just the processes that we use in the software cycle, and applying them all to the infrastructure layer as well. And we'll see how this kind of gives us the, the benefit of the flexibility as well as, as the security needs. So this might be a little bit hard to see. This is a diagram of what we actually implemented at this, this customer. Uh, and if you're interested about it, there's a great blog post by a colleague of mine I linked to down here. But basically, all these things that we needed, like access control, for example, you know, this is built in essentially to Git. It's just, okay, who do we give access to this Git repo to? If you have access to the repo, then you're allowed to make changes. We need an approval process. But we already have this in software, right? You do a merge request, and then somebody approves your merge request. So now it's the same thing for uh, an infrastructure change. And finally, auditing. Again, this is just baked into Git. Every change that's made gets logged with who did it at what time. So this way, we, we s resolve all of these strong security requirements, but we're still able to go fast. And I think this is working pretty well for them at this point. So I'd like to jump into the, the second case set here. And this is another kind of very large, a little more traditional company. Uh, and this was Ericsson. And the teams that we were working with were going from a very strong transition. 
So they were coming from a place where they were actually delivering physical hardware. So their applications would be installed on their servers and they deliver these servers to clients. But what they were, wanted to do was move to a model of just delivering software. And so a particular team we were working with, uh, and this was a team in Spain, they decided to take advantage of this opportunity and go a step further. Why can't we take this and go full cloud native? And for the most part, this was what I would say is a standard cloud native migration. It wasn't anything overly challenging. You know, you have a large monolith, you break it down into microservices. From there, you take all the pieces and you containerize them. And then, you know, we deploy them essentially on Kubernetes so that we have this nice cloud native application. So it's definitely complex, there's a lot of work, but nothing overly unique. But the problem was that they still had to actually deliver this software to the clients. And how do you actually, you know, how do you deliver the cloud? How do you take its Kubernetes native application and, and deliver it? Well, there, there was two things that happened here. One was that they made this assumption or requirement essentially on their clients that, hey, if you want to run our new software, you're going to need a Kubernetes cluster. I think this was a bit of a, a bold decision, but kind of really shows where this, um, where we're going in terms of an industry. But even with this in place, there's still kind of this matter of how do I actually deliver this? Even a simple Kubernetes application, there's lots of pieces, right? We've got our Docker images with all applications. We've got our service definitions, our deployments, our config maps, our secrets. So how do you package that up and send it to your actual clients? I'm sure most people in here are familiar with Helm. So Helm is, you know, this is the package manager for Kubernetes, right? And I can use this if I want to install, say, you know, Jenkins or I want to install Prometheus uh, on my cluster. But I can also use it to package my own applications. And so that's essentially what we did here was basically tack this on to a standard CI pipeline. We go through our tests and builds and deploy to their internal servers. And then we just add this step at the end where, okay, we create our Helm charts with our new application now that it's been vetted. And we deploy this to a repository for our clients kind of access to. So from there they can go ahead and they can decide when they want to update. And also it creates a separation between the actual application code which lives in the Docker images and then the Helm chart which deploys, which decides how your application gets configured and deployed. So I think this is a really interesting model. Um, it's kind of this, potentially this is the new way that we could deliver uh, enterprise software. And these are the kind of things that are become possible as Kubernetes becomes more standard and becomes kind of omnipresent, right? This, this idea that Kubernetes is the new base. Uh, and then we can start building on top and see some of these new models. So one other challenge that, that we had uh, at Ericsson and that I've seen kind of at a lot of companies um, relates to this. Anybody seen, knows what this word is? I just found it a few weeks ago and I was very excited. <laughs> so this is the fear of clouds. <laughs> and this, this is something that we see a lot, right? If, especially at these, you know, especially at enterprise companies where either there is some scary legal department or there's a security team that just doesn't trust it, or some management layer that, that doesn't want to go there, or maybe an internal platform team which doesn't want to let go of what they have. Um, but a lot of times, you know, there are valid reasons where you need to run things on-prem, but in general, the benefits you're gonna get from running on a public cloud are, are pretty large. The chances are that, you know, your company is gonna build a internal Kubernetes platform that is more performant or more secure than, you know, Google or Amazon are pretty slim. And the benefits of, that, of running on there is, is pretty beneficial. So in general, we try and recommend a few ways to, you know, if you're at a company and you have this kind of pushback of starting to, to move towards public cloud. You want to do this by kind of slow, iterative steps uh, and doing some experimentation. So an important thing to do is just understand what are the, you know, what are the reasons why people are, are avoiding it? You know, is it a legal issue? Is it people who don't know, who think the performance is not going to be as good? Once you understand this, you can start to build the story around why this, this might be a, a good thing to try. And then just do iterations. You know, run, take something like um, your dev or test environment. Try running that. Maybe there's less restrictions. Or, you know, use something that's um, a, a piece of application that's maybe not critical. And then from there, you can kind of build on top of this. And, and then finally, just share your results. Once people start seeing the benefits of how easy it is and can be to run on public cloud, uh, 
hearts and minds tend to change. You know, this is kind of a, a long flight and one that we see at a lot of organizations, but the benefit of, of opening up at least partially to running things on public cloud can really allow you to go a lot quicker. So that brings me to the, the last case study. Um, and it's nice when these, these projects all go well and everybody's happy. <coughs> but we all know that this isn't always the case. You know, sometimes things don't go very well. And in looking at the, the projects that, that don't work out, often we can learn a little bit more. So the challenge that we had at this next example was something that, a problem I think that we see in tech a lot. And this is the attraction to the, the new and shiny. Uh, something that I know I'm guilty of quite a bit, where you come to maybe a conference like this, and you see somebody doing a great talk on you know, service meshes. And you're like, yes, this solves exactly the problem that I have right now. You know, and maybe it does. Uh, but oftentimes there, there's simpler solutions. And we just, you know, we like to play with this newest technology, so we find ways to, to kind of shoe it in. So every now and then we get contacted by, by a company who's essentially maybe gone to or seen some videos uh, and decide that, you know, I'd like to order one, one Kubernetes, please. <laughs> uh, I'm really proud of this joke, by the way. <laughs> And so at this point, you know, you start asking questions and finding out, okay, what are your actual challenges? You know, what are your problems? Why do you think that Kubernetes might be the right fit? And sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. So this specific case, um, as we started probing, they were saying that basically they were looking to lower their cloud bills. They were running on uh, EC2, I believe, and then wanted to migrate to Kubernetes and thought that this could better use, or they could make better use of their resources uh, and bring down the cloud bill, which seemed like a pretty reasonable thing to do, um, but in reality, you should have, should have dug a little bit deeper and tried to find out more. Uh, as we started the project and, and started working on a proof of concept to migrate from EC2 to Kubernetes, you know, the warning signs kind of quickly came up. So the first thing was there was basically no tests, uh, which was a little bit shocking at first, and then, you know, they told us, oh, we have a QA team, and, you know, they do all their testing on a QA environment which essentially was 100% manual. You know, they had some scripts or basically some, some <coughs> stages that they, they walked through, but it was pretty much manual testing. Uh, we did find some unit testing, unit tests which were commented out because they had broken the build at one point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe at this point I should have already kind of stopped and said, okay, maybe let's, let's take a look if this is really the right, right time to move to Kubernetes, but sometimes I tend to get a little over-enthusiastic about the technical challenge. So the next, thing, the next thing was that there wasn't any standard development environment. You know, every developer on the team had a different way of doing things. Some people had a make file, some people used Docker Compose, some people just had some scripts they wrote. Again, this is not a really good sign that you're going to have a good environment, or a good, uh, uh, word that I forgot. <laughs> but the third thing is that uh, there was no infrastructure automation. So like I mentioned, they were running EC2. So essentially, all of their environments were just created through clicks in the Amazon uh, AWS UI. Which, you know, it's nice because it's quick and easy, but essentially you have no idea what actually exists in production. It's not really documented anywhere. And so in this case, we wanted to create a, a production-like environment for our POC. It was essentially impossible. So, you know, these three things kind of made it really not difficult, but almost meaningless to, to go ahead with the migration. So at the end of the day, you know, we were able to migrate one of their applications over to Kubernetes, ran some tests to show that yes, in fact, the cloud bill would be a little bit lower. But did we actually help them at all? We didn't really solve any of their problems. Because, you know, even with this, if they migrate everything to Kubernetes, they're going to run into all these same issues they had before, because they don't have tests, they don't have infrastructure automation. So generally what we, we try and do is, is go through a little bit more detail and understand uh, the company's maturity because it goes well beyond just the technology. Uh, so this is a tool that we often use to try and understand where are you in terms of, you know, not just your, your infrastructure and your, uh, your provisioning tools, but look at culture, look at processes, um, look at the maintenance. Because you don't want to really, you need to improve all of these things because they're very strongly connected. You know, just introducing a new technology is, again, not going to solve So these are just a few of the examples of the challenges that I think we see more of uh, as we get to this kind of post-chasm era. A few of them that we 
we've actually already heard from today, so stateful applications. Again, this is something in the, in the pre-CASM days, I'll say, was basically like, just don't do it. You know, don't run your databases on Kubernetes. But this is actually getting more and more easy to do now. You know, there's nice tools like Rook, uh, like OpenEBS, which make it uh, pretty feasible to do that. Uh, Windows, again, like last year, somebody asked me a window, no, don't run <laughs> But actually in 1.14, uh, Windows containers and Windows nodes actually got GA support, which is kind of astounding. In hybrid cloud, you know, more and more people are asking about this, I want to run partially on Google, partially on Amazon, or partially on-prem. Uh, and this is something, again, which is becoming more and more possible with things like service meshes and other tools. And of course, there are, there are many other challenges, probably lots that you've already seen, uh, and some more that, we're gonna, that are gonna come. But essentially, you know that Kubernetes has kind of made its way to, this, to the majority, to the mainstream market. What we're actually seeing, even though this market is huge, is that there are less features and less, less new changes kind of coming to Kubernetes, right? It's really, as we see, the, the majority of the mainstream market are really interested in security, interested in reliability. And, you know, if we go back to that earlier story about uh, federation, you know, Kubernetes is no longer at a point where this can happen. Some big, important uh, feature just goes away. You know, in the case of student.com, they were a small startup. They were able to, you know, find another solution and it wasn't that big a deal. But a large enterprise company, if something like that happens, the cornerstone of your new design just disappears, it's going to be a lot bigger trouble. So partially this influence of, of the enterprise and the mainstream market is actually making Kubernetes become more and more stable. In fact, we're seeing that Kubernetes is becoming pretty boring. You know, the recent releases, there's some stability, some kind of maybe security things, but no more big features. The thing is that I think that was really the point. You know, this is what we want to get to point where Kubernetes becomes this stable layer, almost invisible, and on top of that we can start to build interesting things. Uh, you know, this, this standard thing that exists, then we can find these new models. And the innovation is not going anywhere. So we already saw this once today, this is the, the CNCF landscape. You know, this thing just blows my mind every time I look at it, trying to keep track of all the things. But the, the innovation keeps going. You know, a lot of these tools, a lot of these projects will mature themselves and will eventually, you know, cross the chasm, as you say, and get to the mainstream market, and a lot of them are going to go away. But this is the point of innovation, like, that things are going to keep going. And what we continue to see is that, you know, it's this, the mainstream market is going to influence cloud native and, and the direction that it goes. You know, we see the focus is on things like security uh, and even talking about open policy agent. You know, this is something which I think comes much more from these bigger companies. But at the same time, cloud native is also influencing the mainstream market. You know, these, again, traditional companies have to change the way that they do things if they really want to leverage uh, the technologies in the cloud native tools. So I think the end, up, the end result of this is, is both, sorry, is, is really good for both sides. 